Hey, this is Mira Beck, founder of Overnight Success Publishing, and welcome to another episode of Overnight Success TV. On today's episode, I have a distinct pleasure of interviewing one of my friends, best-selling author, keynote speaker, and mastermind mentor, Jay Fizet. Glad you. to have you remote from Canada, right? Yes, very remote from Canada. So happy to be here. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us remotely like this. And uh, I, I just want to dive straight into it. Um, so let's just talk about, let's start in the beginning. Let's just talk about the upbringing. I always like to get a background of where people came from. And if you know you were born entrepreneur or if uh, you uh, kind of had to work your way uh, into it. That's, that's a really great question. So I grew up in a rural community in Saskatchewan, a little town called Scepter that had 60 people on a good day when the farmers were in town hauling grain to the elevator. Um, three streets this way, three streets that way, if you count the highway. Um, and anyone from Saskatchewan knows you always count the highway because that's what puts you on the map. So um, I had basically uh, on both sides of my family, my grandparents were farmers. So perhaps, you know, the original uh, survival entrepreneurs. Um, and then my dad was a salesman and my mom stayed at home. So, um, you know, that was really sort of the roots. But one of the things I loved about where I grew up is that everyone there has a pretty epic um, work ethic. And it was pretty simple and straightforward. Is if you wanted something, then you got your ass in gear and you went to work for it. And uh, I bought my first uh, bicycle uh, from Pick and Bottles. I bought my first car from Pick and Bottles. Um, did my first joint venture on a car when I was 12 years old and me and my best friend Fritz made 600 bucks each. So um, I think it's safe to say I, I, I was entrepreneurial from the core, uh, even before I knew what it meant. That's pretty awesome. So uh, what, did you go to, uh, I'm assuming obviously high school or something, but uh, how high did your formal education go? You know, I finished high school. I went and I did a year of pre-law, which I utterly and completely detested. And uh, although I'm a pretty good debater, um, the, the whole structure of law and was not for me. Um, so then I went and I uh, started a business, which was a construction promotion business. Um, and that led me to a variety of pieces um, and, and my first epic business failure. Uh, and I went back to school and took business administration after that to figure out what the hell I did wrong. Yeah. And um, then I have been um, self-employed slash unemployable ever since. And uh, that's, you know, literally since I've been, uh, I've been working on my own, uh, I guess, officially since I was 19, 18, actually. That's pretty cool. I love the unemployable uh, mention because that's what I've been saying the last 12 years. So it's, uh, I cannot imagine working for anyone at this point. I mean, I, I, I would have to go into that company and start looking at all the stuff that can be improved and deal with all the people that don't want to hear it. So uh, yeah, I think this is uh, you know entrepreneurial lifestyle for uh, the rest of our lives. So that's, that's pretty cool. And obviously you're living, you're living the lifestyle too. So at 19, tell me, um, what, what did you uh, do first after school? Uh, well, which time after law or after I, after business administration? After the business administration. Yeah. Well, this is kind of a, a fascinating story because, um, in between these things, uh, my business partner in the construction company, uh, took this personal transformation course, this personal development program. And uh, while I was working there, cause it had such a radical impact on him and on our business it was pretty fantastic and amazing. Um, I went and did those courses and, um, and it was, it was really in those courses where I decided I was going to go back to school and I was going to uh, do business administration and figure out what was going on. Um, but before I was even done, um, before I was done the program, that organization uh, reached out to me and asked me to take their facilitator training program. Now, what's funny is I did it as a lark. Um, I didn't want to do that for a living because I knew what they made and it was not enough. Yeah. Um, but I said yes, because the skills of the people who led those programs in terms of communication, in terms of teaching, uh, in terms of understanding the human psyche and what motivates human beings, they were some of the smartest human beings I had ever experienced. And uh, so I went and did that, you know, for my own purposes, not really to work for them, but it was a 30 day program. It was kind of structured like the original survivor. Um, I think there's 30 of us applied, 10 of us, uh, 10 of us were accepted and four of us survived. Oh, wow. um, but at the end of that, it was like, I'd found my mission in life. This is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I went to work for the organization, personal best seminars in the summer of 198. Well, the summer of 1988, I did my training. And to work for them that summer, and I bought the company in May of 1991, um, and I still own that company. 
So I have done uh, really one core business for 30 years with a bunch of offshoots from television production, real estate investing and developing, uh, financial services, restaurants, um, internet marketing, and, and you know the thing that I that that is interesting. We're spending a lot of time now teaching coaches, authors, entrepreneurs, um, and subject matter experts to position, launch, and lead masterminds, which is something that we've been doing for 25 years with my personal development program. Wow. So it's really one core business that has created a whole variety of offshoots, and I've been doing it for 30 years. Wow, that's really <laughs> oh, that's funny. So that's really cool. Yeah, I don't think I. Yeah, I don't think I've ever met anyone that's been doing masterminds this long. You know, my first introduction to masterminds was just kind of the traditional thinking grow rich, and I did my first event uh, when I started uh, the, my video production company. And uh, the very first client I had actually was Dan Kennedy's student, so they introduced me to you know a lot of the Dan Kennedy style marketing and masterminds and. Uh, thinking grow rate. So uh, before that, like when I went to school, it was they don't teach you this stuff at school, right? So you need to really go and learn it on your own. And the concept of mastermind, I've said it now several times when people ask me for one of my keys to success, I always say to be part of a mastermind. And I've been yes. part of at least one or two um, at the same time for over 10 years now. So I totally, uh, I totally get it. And I think that's phenomenal that not only that you've discovered it so long ago, but that you've been actually teaching others and running your masterminds uh, for this long. So it's, it's super impressive. And I think we can, you know, I would really like to, for you to share, let, talk about, let's talk about masterminds. Let's just have you to be the guest that uh, we dive a little deeper into the concept of mastermind. What is it in your definition? Uh, is, you know, is it a traditional think and grow rich stuff or is it, uh, do you have your own spin on it? And, um, People that are watching this show, if somebody wants to put together a mastermind group, uh, is there any basics, any quick do's and don'ts that you can share with them? And uh, of course, you know, I'll be uh, happy to share some of the resources and have people uh, connect with you and attend one of your um, uh, masterminds to millions events, or if they want to take you to the next level, I know you have the resources and opportunities for that, so we can do that as well. But let's just touch on some basics that anybody can use that's looking into this. You bet. Well, <clears throat> you asked about 192 questions in there, brother. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So let's let's go down the list. I, <laughs> I know, right? I got plenty of time. I think you're the busy one. Okay. So um, let, let's start at, at the beginning. And I think that it's important in terms of what you're saying is, uh, to tell people how we landed in this spot. So, uh, you know, for years I ran this personal transformation company and, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever done personal development programs, but you know, there are experiences where people have these amazing breakthroughs and uh, they see themselves differently. They see their role in the world differently. And, you know, sometimes there's even an emotional expression of it and people are clapping and it's all exciting. And, you know, those are stunning and beautiful moments. Make no mistake about it. But here's an interesting piece is that, I ran this company in a you know small Canadian city, um, basically, well, a couple of small, in Alberta, let's just call it our province. And I live and work in those, in that same city. I'm there literally for 30 years. I see my clients at the grocery store. I see my clients at Starbucks, all those pieces. So I have a different view and a different um, connection to my clients than I think many organizations in that personal development realm, which would fly in somewhere, do a course, fly out, and it's like, oh, it wasn't that great, we changed lives. Um, but here's the honest God truth of it, is that in most cases, the breakthrough that they touch, that they feel that they experience, that breakthrough doesn't hold when they go back to their lives. Yeah. Because the life, the world, the business, the relationships that they created with their old beliefs, literally, there's the gravity of those decisions and that life that they designed pulls them back. Mm -hmm. Except here's the son of a bitch. It pulls them back, but it hurts more because they have a glimpse of what's possible that they're not actually able to step into. Yeah. So anyway, you know, we've got 40,000 graduates that have traveled from all over God's green earth to come to Alberta primarily to do these courses and programs. And, um, you know, a breakthrough is fine, but I am far more interested in, how did it change what kind of parent you are? How did it change your uh, business? How did it change how you show up with your husband or your wife or your partner or your lover or whatever it happens to be? That's the part I'm interested in. So anyway, I noticed this, this piece of people getting pulled back. 
And about 25 years ago, we designed these longer term programs, of course, mastermind groups, um, yep. to support people to have the environment, the community and the ecosystem for them to live into that transformation. Hmm. And those that participated in the masterminds did far better in transforming their lives over the long haul. So I trained all of my coaches, I trained all of my facilitators, I trained all of my team, uh, and we literally gave birth to hundreds and hundreds of masterminds. We gave birth to hundreds and hundreds of mastermind leaders. Um, and then, I guess it was about five or six years ago, somebody said to me, he's like, hey, how'd you do that? And I said, well, I've got this manual. And uh, you know, years ago, like 25 mm -hmm. years ago, I paid like $15,000 to develop this in terms of testing, tweaking, adjusting, hiring, adapting, like all of those pieces. So yeah. I've got this little manual I'm not really using right now. If you want it, I'll just give it to you. And, and the most amazing, amazing, amazing thing happened in Maribel, which was in giving that away, that exploded into like a $2.6 million business in about 14 months. Mm -hmm. um, and was, it was, quote, accidental. I wish I could say it was like I was this brilliant strategist who did, you know, none mm -hmm. of that's true. It's just we, we had done it for so long and had uh, really come up with processes and structures that work that it just took our internal process, did some adjustments for uh, external and it, it has been become a runaway. So anyway, I, I just wanted people to understand that, you know, when I say I've been at this 25 years, it isn't, I didn't just uh, jump on the bandwagon and that's how that happened. Yes. Awesome. So that's really cool. So what, uh, what kind of fu uh, fundamentals or foundational pieces, if you will, would you share with uh, someone uh, that's never heard of a mastermind. Let's start with that because I'm assuming everybody knows mastermind just like I assumed everybody knew Dan Kennedy before I bought a chapter and started teaching Dan Kennedy style marketing in Tampa just to realize that nobody knew who he was. So in our little world you have these superstars that nobody knows their name outside of our little bubble. So uh, instead of assuming everybody knows what mastermind is, let's, let's just uh, share a little bit about what it even is as a concept. Absolutely. <clears throat> So it's impossible to have this conversation without a tip of the hat to good old Napoleon Hill and think and grow rich. And for those of you who don't know, um, Napoleon Hill was hired by Andrew Carnegie, one of the wealthiest human beings on planet Earth at the time, to go and do research about what made the most successful people on planet Earth that successful. Like, what did they do differently? How did they think differently? How was their state of being different? And um, Napoleon Hill wrote this book, Think and Grow Rich, and it really tracks... Um, what the wealthiest in the world, how, what their state of being is, what they did and what they had and how that was different. One of the things was these, he, he noticed that all of these movers and shakers had these tight knit groups of people that they could count on, mm -hmm. that they would come together and they would share. And this, by the way, if you're not already clear about this, just either make a strong mental note or jot this down, is that a great mastermind group is where the members share network, wisdom, resources, and experience and do so in an open and forthright manner with the express purpose to help one another leapfrog off one another's uh, wins, losses, challenges, and lessons so that the contribution of the group can be magnified in an epic and astounding way. I mean, I, I truly believe when you're in the right mastermind and that structure and that context and that culture is there, um, masterminds bend time. Honest to God, we, we accomplish things in days, weeks, and months that would have been months, years, or never just yeah. with the resources of a mastermind group. So it's usually a small group of people. They come together for an express purpose um, and they share network wisdom, resource and experiences in an open way. There is not really a guru at the front of the room. There's not really a coach or a trainer at the front of the room that is telling everybody what to do. There is more of a facilitator or a mentor that creates the culture, the relationships and the environment for the group to support one another. Um, and of course, the, a great facilitator mentor participates in that support, um, but the group does not look to the mentor for, hey, what do we do here? The group develops a culture and develops a mission and develops a purpose that they can guide themselves. Now, there still needs to be a facilitator, and that's a big deal we'll talk about. Um, yeah. But when that happens well, it is the most magical and stunning experience in the universe. Yeah, it's awesome. I, you know, my... Uh experience from all the masterminds for me it's a place that i go to where my mind works on completely different level it's most of the time it's not even what anybody says in that group it's just the somehow the energy makes me think of things that either get triggered or it's just because i'm there and just to unplug from my business and go to a two-day mastermind every few months 
um, it's just been always invaluable. Like I can't even describe it. And I think kind of the definition is right where uh, two minds come together, it creates a third mind type thing. So that's really kind of the mastermind, if you will, maybe. Um, but it's it's amazing just the environment of the mastermind besides all the technicalities outside of it. Correct. Well, and, and I'd like to just take a step further to that, that Mira, in terms of the, that you bring that up, is that um, Napoleon said that whenever two minds come together, uh, unexpressed versus a third mind comes uh, manifest. Um, and, and I firmly believe this. And, and I actually think that in its pure sense, a great mastermind is a spiritual experience. Even if, by the way, it's an entrepreneurial mastermind or a technical mastermind or you know any of those things, it's still actually a spiritual experience. Because the synergy when a group of people come together with a common goal and purpose um, is magical. Now, I, I, I wanna say something in a slightly different manner that I think is important though, is that when we create an environment in a mastermind, where I, let's, and let's imagine you and I are in a mastermind, where I stand for the best in you, Mira, even when you forget it yourself, even when you're having a difficult time, even when you've gotten a little off track, but I still know who you are and what you're capable of, and damn it, it's part of my job to remind you and to invite you back to the greatness that is you. And when I forget, and I'm off track, and I'm having a tough time, you do the same for me. Yeah. I, I, would, I would plant this seed that the truth is, um, not only is it a spiritual experience in terms of this third mind, is that what gives birth to the third mind is actually a grounding of love. Because to stand for the best in one another, even when they forget, at its core, that's what it is. It's a stand for another human being's greatness. It's a stand in love for their possibility and their contribution to the planet. And when done well, that's quite literally what we create is this foundation of love, respect, admiration, and a stand for the contribution that one another is going to make in the, in the world. That's really awesome. I never heard that. Uh, point of view, so I appreciate you sharing that. That's that's really cool. Um, so, give me a few tips that uh, someone who wants to start a mastermind, besides plugging in into your resources and stuff, um, what would be kind of the rule of thumb? How do you start something like that? <laughs> um, well, you know, there's so many things I could say here, but I I, I want to give a a contextual grounding first. And then I'm going to give you the six pillars of masterminds that work. And, and honestly, those six pillars is we build everything around those six pillars because they are either present or the mastermind will die. And I don't want anybody to go have that experience. Um, so here's the first piece is that if you're going to run a mastermind, step number one, and this might sound um, a tad obvious to some, but is this, is you need to be in a mastermind. You need yeah. to be in a mastermind. So in the right. same way as I, you know, and I've certified quite literally hundreds and hundreds of coaches over the years, um, mm -hmm. is that I wouldn't hire a coach who doesn't have a coach if I had a gun to my head. Yeah. It's inconsistent. They don't get the value of coaching. They're not walking their talk. They're not in alignment. There's not a hope in it. No, never. Um, so here's the thing. If you want to start a mastermind, step number one, get in a mastermind. So have a sense of what the hell it is and at least be in alignment to what your message and what your invitation is. So my belief is this, is that all, Coaches, authors, entrepreneurs, subject matter experts should all be in two masterminds. One which they are in that sharpens their leading learning edge, that keeps them excited and engaged in their you know, evolution. And another, which is probably, sometimes it feels like it's just a little bit, you know, been there, done that, 1984, you know, way back when, but yep. a, a group where you can channel and support um, a pathway to success for part of your tribe that you can sort of say, look, I've been there, done that, and I can help like the way. And all of us should bookend our lives and our businesses with masterminds like this because it is the quantum accelerator, absolutely the quantum accelerator. So the first thing is be in alignment, right? And find a mastermind and lead a mastermind. Okay. That's step one. Now, I, I'm going to run through the six pillars, and I will do my very best to do this as, as quickly as I can, Mirren. If I get on a tangent, <laughs> as I sometimes do because I get a little passionate about this, just like crack the whip and reel me in. <laughs> Sounds like a plan, but I'm excited to hear it. So I don't know if I'm going to stop you. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> the first of the six pillars, and I should just give some framing here. These six pillars, the first three are all about getting your mastermind up and running. Mm -hmm. And the last three are all about keeping your mastermind up and running. Mm -hmm. And depending upon your skill set um, and, and your capacity, like if you're a great marketer, getting a mastermind up and running, pretty simple, straightforward. Keeping it, not so easy. Now, there are others who are great facilitators and great community builders and great tribe builders who are crappy marketers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, most of us have a uh, sort of a tendency to be better at one than the other. But please understand, all six are important. So here's the first one. It's called perfect positioning. 
And this is where, by the way, um, this is where most of the masterminds that never get off the ground go awry. So in perfect positioning, we start with this. What is the promise of the mastermind? What is going to be different in somebody's life in terms of their experiences, in terms of their network, in terms of their resources, in terms of what it is that they actually create? So the promise of the mastermind must meet exactly, exactly the tribe that you want to reach. So the promise is first. Now, the next piece is, who is it actually for? And does the promise make sense to them? And if it does, great. If it doesn't, you're screwed, to, be, to put it mildly. And yeah. this is one of those things where in a mastermind, you're not, this isn't mass marketing. We're not trying to get 10,000 people uh, to a series of events. We're not trying to get thousands of people to an online launch to take an online course. We're trying to get generally eight to 12, depending on how you're going to structure it, eight to 12 people who are committed and are willing to pay for this promise because it's what they need in their life right now. So I'll give you just a super simple example. Um, so I have a premium mastermind, which is called the seven figure business breakthrough. Now here's a little hint, by the way, the name of your mastermind ideally is also the promise of your mastermind. It is no big surprise what that mastermind is focused upon. The seven figure business breakthrough we sit around and we just drink wine because it's a wine club. You know, like, like put those things together. I'm, yeah. and I'm being kind of a facetious ass about that, but you would not believe the, the number of, of topics that I get with the name that has nothing to do with what the hell the promise is. Yeah. So line up the promise. Then we got to figure out who cares about this promise. Because the newly minted coach doesn't care about this promise. I mean, they might say that they do, but it's lip service because they haven't broken a hundred thousand bucks yet. Yeah. Uh, so who cares about this promise are people in this niche. They're doing somewhere between $300,000 and $500,000 a year. They have an online program that they've had at least one marginally successful launch with. They know how to speak from stage and perhaps they even have their own event, but these things happen sort of separately and need to be woven together for them to break seven figures. Now, in that, pro in that process, if they are the right match, here's the deal. The seven-figure business breakthrough position for that group of people doing 300 plus or minus to 500, and we're going to help them get past 700, that masterminds, $100,000. Now, here's the kicker to it, though, is that from our perspective, that is a guarantee, meaning that you break seven figures, you get your 100,000 bucks back. So that's the distinction about promise and positioning. And those two things have to match up absolutely perfectly. Absolutely perfectly. Then here's the third part in terms of positioning, which is, are you recognized or seen as the leader of that tribe. Mm. And this is where people go awry all the time as well. Now, in that circumstance, yes, I'm the leader of that tribe. I have done it for myself a multitude of times. I've done it for other people a multitude of times. When I take on my one-on-one -on -one clients, which I do very, very seldom, but when I do, that's almost always the people that I choose because I know I can knock it out of the park for them. So yeah. I have a proven track record in that scenario. And frankly, people can come to my events and watch me do a million bucks in a weekend as opposed to, uh, you know, struggling for years on. Does yeah. that make sense? Totally. So that's the positioning piece. And if the positioning piece, all those things add up, that honest to God is 95% of your mastermind marketing. Mm -hmm. If those things aren't lined up, you're done. Yeah. Now, by the way, I've already sort of given away uh, pillar number two, which is personal evolution, being the leader your tribe wants to follow, which is, do you have the results? Do you have the network? Do you have the influence? Do you have the wisdom to mm -hmm. actually be seen as the leader and somebody who can put that tribe together and contribute? And if you do, Yahoo, slam dunk. If you don't, then you've got some personal work to do. And this, we borrow from our, uh, you know, 30 years of running personal transformation programs that I think we do better than anyone else on planet Earth. So first one, perfect position. Second one, personal evolution. Then the third one is fill your mastermind with ease. And that is where we help people take the three steps, um, which is relationship. And it's easy to create a relationship today online, right? You can opt into somebody's Facebook page. You can become a friend. You can have an instant messenger. You can send an email. You can have a, you can text. I mean, the, the relationship's easy. Yeah. But, but for us to actually succeed at a mastermind, we have to move from relationship up to intimacy where we actually know and begin to care about someone. Yeah. Having a relationship with them doesn't mean that we care. That's For most people, right. in fact, in the digital world, having a relationship means I have an agenda. I'd like to sell that person some X, Y, Z, and L, and right. um, but, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about intimacy, where we actually begin to care about what they want, what they need, where they're at in their lives, um, what's most significant to them. And then it is truly, and please, this is another writer downer, folks, if you're paying attention, is that the transition from relationship to intimacy 
and intimacy to influence is where we begin to actually support them with what is most important to them. And it is only when we get to the stage of influence that it's super easy to get them into a mastermind. So we teach a bunch of processes called the fill your mastermind with ease process, the wine conversation, the cash process, but they are all aimed at this idea of developing a relationship, increasing intimacy and getting to a position of influence. And that's where the mastermind knocks it out of the park. And those are the first three pillars. Mm -hmm. is this going too long, brother? Or are we doing okay? Oh, I think we're doing great. I think this is gold. Okay. So hopefully you're taking notes. You better. Yeah. Well, yes. And, 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 while not all of this is in the manual, uh, the, uh, there's a, a free resource, the, the actual manual that, uh, that we use to train uh, trainers, uh, to train our, our people, uh, we're going to make available to you so you guys can get that. Um, so, that so this is implicit in all of those pieces. And of course, um, there's lots of ways for them to learn more about this. Okay, the last three, I'll go through real, real fast. Most masterminds fail, uh, or at least the people who are participating in it say that it didn't work because commitment began to fall. Mm -hmm. um, so here's the thing. We have an entire module around commitment, getting commitment, setting commitment, resetting commitment, um, and evaluating commitment because that whole piece is unbelievably important. We teach nine very, spe <laughs> nine. <laughs> <laughs> nine very specific strategies of how to do that, that actually start before you enroll them or let them into your mastermind. And um, just... Here's something to know about masterminds. If you're doing long-term masterminds, like year-long mastermind, mm -hmm. understand this. The commitment will wane. It is as natural as to human beings as breathing. There will be relationship friction in the group, which you need to handle, all of those pieces. So while the world says the issue with masterminds is a lack of commitment, it's not entirely true. Mm -hmm. You need to manage commitment, and it takes us to our fifth pillar, which is facilitating skills. You have to have some skills about running small groups. You have to have some, some skills about structuring and how to create the social binding and the social norms and the environment and ecosystem for this thing to actually thrive. And it is the absence of facilitation skills that cause the reduced commitment. And that's the piece that people miss all the time. So yeah. those, those things come together. And then the last piece that we have is, is called uh, compelling content. And this is... Um, little experiential content bombs that move the group forward towards the stated promise. Think of it almost like the lubrication um, and the stickiness that helps the group stay together, working together in an inspired way. So it's a little bit of inspiration. It's a little bit of education and, and it's a little bit of uh, sometimes coopetition mm -hmm. to move the group forward um, as a cohesive view. And those are the six pillars and honest to goodness, as straight as I can say this, you get those six pillars lined up or your mastermind will fail. It's not a question of if, it's only a question of when. I love it. Thanks for sharing all these pillars because if you are really thinking about um, starting your mastermind, uh, I don't think I've ever heard anybody really having such a scientific approach to, uh, to masterminds. And everything you're saying totally makes sense. I just never seen it put into a system like this. So it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Yeah, you're, you're, you're welcome, Miran. And that honest to goodness is really the, the 20,000 foot view. And, sure, and I yeah. think what makes us, you know, I'm tooting my own horn and my team's horn because I got an exceptional team around me that I'm, I'm very, very grateful for. Um, what makes us great at this is that um, we lived the trenches for a quarter century. Mm -hmm. And not only did we live the trenches for a quarter century, is that I had to train literally hundreds of people to do this process yeah. and and we got to uh you know frankly learn by experience and 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 you know i've been training facilitators now for 30 years so it was it was a, a, our capacity to teach the process that i think separates us from there's lots of people that run processes absolutely stunningly well and beautifully that that have come to it you know through their own trial and error but we've mapped it so that we can replicate it and we can give it to people on a silver platter so they can do it Perfect. Thank you. Now, put on your uh, business hat and share with us a couple of, you know, two or three different um, learning experiences, if you will, from all those years that you've been running a business. And what I really mean by that is they don't teach you that at school. Typically, you go in, you have to figure out on your own. So if you lost it all, if you had to start all over again, which are some of the keys to your business success that you would implement? What would you do now a days? 
Okay. So, so you went a little underwater there for a bit, Mira. So I'm just going to make sure I understood the question, which is if I had to start over again, what are the biggest uh, significant contributors to my success and what would I uh, either do differently or how would I go about it today? Yes. That's right. So yeah, sorry, it, it did choke a little bit here. So um, really, I, you know, one of my quotes is uh, every um, failure is a deposit to your success account. So we strive on failures, you know, you fail flat, fast, learn from it, move on to the next thing. So uh, some of these things that you had to learn the hard way, that if you had to uh, do it all over again, you know, it would be much easier for you. Or if you could actually share that with someone for them, hopefully they're smart enough to learn from your lesson and my lesson versus trying to do it on their own, which I think sometimes may be a long stretch. But, um, but if, you, if, you, if you can give some young entrepreneur advice on, in, in business, Sure. If, if they are smart enough to do that, that means they're smarter than me because I, I have had a penchant for my own very expensive lessons. <laughs> yes. And me, I, I try to figure out all my own too. So I get it. Okay. So um, I really think that, that, and it's interesting because I just turned 50 and uh, for whatever reason, I, I've been feeling a little nostalgic lately um, in terms of looking back at sort of pivotal moments and, and, you know, things I did brilliantly well, um, things that I, I, that were epic, you know, you know failures and there's a whole lot more of the latter, just to be clear. So I like your quote. Um, it's funny. I, I had a, a young man, he was like 22. He was uh, volunteering for one of my live events mm -hmm. and, uh, but, he, but he asked great questions. So he was picking my brain and, and because they were good questions, I just sort of let it continue on. But I think it was like day three, he, he's sitting there and he's crosses his shoulders and goes, geez, you know, I mean, this is the biggest compliment ever, but you know, you are like, you're, you're the most successful failure I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty fantastic. Um, so on a serious note, um, I think the number one piece, the number one piece above all else is a commitment to do our own personal development work. As entrepreneurs, as business people, as human beings, we are simultaneously our greatest, our greatest um, assets and our single greatest adversaries. And um, when I see what transpires, like looking back for me, and when I see what transpires for um, other entrepreneurs, clients, the game is won or lost, not on the field of business. Yeah. The game is won or lost in our heart, mind, and soul. And having that aligned solves 90% of the silliness that occurs in the human condition and in the world of business. So um, self-awareness, understanding what really drives me, uh, clarifying what my needs are and getting my needs met in as clear and as clean and as healthy as ways as possible. Um, figuring out what the hell my mission is and dedicating my life to fulfill that mission. Yeah. All of those are, that's the key pillar. The stuff after that is, is still important, but without that, um, it's like a compass that can't find true north. It's yeah. a nice tiny little object, but it just doesn't do shit. Yeah. I could not uh, agree more with you. The, the mindset and knowing what you're doing, which brings me to another question that I had for you. Uh, what is your why? Why the heck do you even get out of bed this, you know, in the morning? What drives you these days? Well, you know, it's the same thing that's driven me for 30 years. It, it truly hasn't changed. And, uh, you know, I, I think I was very fortunate many years ago to discover at least a part of my mission. And, um, and in that, that has been always what gets me up uh, and, and goes through the, the, the process is that, um, I'm very intrinsically motivated, I think, because of my clarity of mission. And, and there's, you know, a full document that I could share with you. But the part that I think probably makes the most sense to, to, to people is this. And, and this is really the stand of Personal Best Seminars, the company that I you know, stepped into 30 years ago. And every other little variation that we have created, this would hold true for, is that our, my and our as an organization, our mission is to help humanity heal its motivation structure so that they are not motivated by pain, fear, and scarcity. And so that they become motivated by love, contribution, and mission. And everything that we do is aligned with that grand idea. So getting up in the morning is pretty simple and straightforward for me because 
I am in the ongoing process of doing that for myself. I'm in the ongoing process of supporting my team with that. I'm in the ongoing process of everyone we touch to serve and support them in that manner. Because if we can clean up our motivation structure and get clear about what we're moving towards and why we're actually here on planet Earth, again, the rest becomes pretty simple. That's pretty awesome. So, uh, and just the fact that, you know, you have your why, you have the clarity. I mean, this would be one of the takeaways from this interview for sure, is uh, to make sure that you actually have a why, that you have a reason to get out of bed. And the reasons, is, typically it's bigger than money. You know, like Trump, before he became president, he didn't get up at five in the morning and went to bed at one in the morning because he wants to make more billions. It's, you know, there is a mission, the passion, doing the stuff that you love. and. Uh, try to do something bigger. Uh, I, I've noticed with the younger people, however, they are in that warrior stage still, and they, maybe the money is the passion, that, that's the drive. But I, you know, like when we get, when I start turning six, uh, 40, uh, 60, that's funny, I'm not 60 yet. I'm, I'm a good looking 60 year old. Um, so, you know, as I was approaching the 38 to 40, I started thinking bigger, like, you know, what do I want to leave behind? What's the legacy? What's the why? So I think it, there are, I think, stages of life that everybody goes through. But if you can fast track the stage and start thinking like this in your 20s, you don't have to wait till you're 30 or 40 uh, to discover it. But so I ask you, why do you get out of bed? What's your why? So tell me about your day, day in life of a successful entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, is that a, a broad stroke day or is that a day leading into a live event that's only two and a half weeks away? Uh, it's different. So just your... Except I scratch my unshaven <laughs> face. <laughs> totally. Yeah, right. So, and you've, and it's funny thing is that you've done this, these events, right, for a while. So this is not your first rodeo. And well, it's... 30 years. I mean, we, for, for my personal development company, mm -hmm. for the better part of 25 years, we put on... If we count all of the events for our longer term programs that we would put on about 220 events a year. Now, those aren't big monstrous events. Most of those are, you know, 60 to 80 people, yep. uh, some of the advanced programs, 30 people. But we, yeah, events has been our, our way of life. And I guess the point is really here that even though you've done it for that many years, you're still busy leading up to the event. You're not sitting back, letting whatever machine slash system slash four hour work week, you know, people think that you can have, it's still a lot of work. It's still a hustle, no matter how you slice it, because you know, you will want to show up at your best. So let's just, but let's just talk about your typical day when you're not under a gun before the event, uh, because everybody that I know that's successful has sort of a routine and I kind of want to, you know, get people to see another example of another routine of uh, an entrepreneur. Perfect, perfect. Um, so mine's pretty family centric. So uh, basically get up in the morning with uh, my two boys and my dear wife, uh, get them ready for school. Um, when it's not 40 below, I walk the boys to school. So uh, we get a little time in all those pieces. Uh, we're, we're blessed to live in a really beautiful little spot where the school isn't very far away. That's okay. Um, after that, my dear wife and I, we go to uh, our club where we generally work out and take care of our bodies and uh, sort of plan uh, our day and have breakfast and those sorts of things. And that usually has us home about 11. Um, at uh, 11, I start my day and do, you know, frankly, whatever has to be done. Um, and when I say that, I mean, um, we have team meetings once a week. So I, I don't spend a lot of time managing my team or holding their hands or any of those sorts of things. They're, they're really quite exceptional. Um, so Tuesday is sort of all my team meetings. So um, that's my Facebook gang, my tech team, my, uh, my internal team, my coaching team, all of those pieces. So we do all of those things on Tuesdays. I usually attempt to have one in terms of if I'm doing any coaching, we put that on one day of the week. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I work doing whatever I need to do um, in a variety of different ways because uh, we actually run four different brands right now. So so depends on what's going on. and. You know, I, I would like, it'd be nice to say, it's like, I'm so structured that I do one brand a day, uh, but it is nothing like that in any way, shape or form, particularly because we're on an event model. Um, the brands sort of cycle in terms of the energy and attention they get based upon what the schedule is and how that whole thing processes. Um, then my boys are home generally at 430. And because we're Canadians, then the, the hockey entertainment begins and we're driving all over God's green earth doing hockey and lacrosse and soccer and all those sorts of things in the evenings. Um, and that really is, is it, try and get the boys to bed at a decent time so my wife and I can hang up and have some fun in the evenings. So nice. it's, it's no big, um, um, how do I put it? It's no big, 
it's very normal is yeah. is what well it's very normal for me but it, it, it's yeah. just it's very normal i mean one of the things that i did early on mira is i really set the standard of what my lifestyle was going to be um mm. how much i wanted to make how much i needed to make um what that was going to look like uh, how hard i was willing to work yeah. and uh, you know last year i took all of summer off and most of december so take about three months off a year something like that is what the objective is um right. this year my business partner he's on sabbatical so i only took six weeks off this summer um but that that's how that goes but that's cool you know, I, so some some of the takeaways i got from it is uh have your business support your personal life and a lot of people make the mistake that they don't set these intentions in the very beginning and they let the business run them and there's, you know, the personal life starts falling apart. And um, it sounds like that you have pretty clear goals and you probably set your goals so you know, you know what you're going toward. And even though you call it normal life, um, you know, I don't know really that many people that structure their day around their family. It's, uh, you know, from what you're describing, it sounds like pretty cool life for you and for your boys and they'll remember it that way so it's uh, it's cool so you so you have your priorities straight and um and it's awesome so you know if that uh, applies to you and this is something that you feel motivated by uh do that and i personally found out that if i don't schedule my personal time first then it's not happening because there's always more work there's always more projects there's you know million different things on the list that i can do for the business so fill up my calendar and use maybe some time blocking for my personal time and then fill the rest uh up with work is typically how i can manage otherwise if i don't schedule my vacations in check for a month uh six months in advance at least i'm not going right. it's yeah, uh, it, you know and i, I want to just echo and underscore that because what's interesting is right now as we're moving towards our, our uh, Mastermind to Millions Live event in Phoenix, is that the team asked for daily contact with me because there were so many, uh, so many things. And the only time that that worked was uh, 8 a.m. and 9 a.m., which uh, over summer, I don't have to walk the boys to school, so I could say yes to that. If, if, yeah. if it wasn't summer, I wouldn't. I just would have said no, but I could say yes to it, so I did. But what's interesting is that it, it has thrown my self-care for a loop because I'm used to getting up, doing my thing with the boys, going to the club, working out, and it's, it's a little awry. So it's funny because just yesterday, uh, was it this morning, I think it was actually yesterday or this morning, um, it was just so we know on Friday, this is the last of that because I got to get back to my consistency uh, mm -hmm. for really taking care of myself because otherwise, it, you're right, it just goes. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy for sure. Uh, what do you do for yourself? How do you stay um, you know, energized? through? The, let's just say right now during the pre-event mode, um, what do you do for yourself, for your mind and spirit and really body from a health perspective so you don't drop before the event or during the event and <laughs> you can kind of stay? I know you already said that you work out every day or, at, you know, probably most of the days. But uh, besides that, what, uh, what other things do you do? Well, it, I, I tell you, I have an interesting sort of combo. And, um, and you know, I told you that I, I have an entire document for my mission. And I, I actually have a weekend program called Mastery, Meaning, and Mission that I teach for uh, the process that I created. But I actually have my mission recorded with affirmations and visualizations and all of those pieces about guiding me and my life and what's important and living my values and all those pieces. And I actually listen to it while I work out. So I run, generally speaking, five to seven K, five, five days a week. So, you know, I'm putting on 25 to 35 ish kilometers, depending on what's going on. Yeah. Um, still trying to do a little bit of, of actual uh, sort of resistance training, weight training, you know, those kinds of things to, to burn some more calories. Um, but that's always integrated into my, uh, my mission, my affirmations and uh, that reinforcement of what it is that I'm looking for. So the two aren't really that separate. So, so those are, are really big pieces. Um, I, I do, a, I'm pretty consistent with a vitamin routine that uh, is from a, a doctor that I go to here. Um, I almost always enjoy a glass or two of wine, um, just as, you know, an evening sort of relaxed thing. And, and I actually think that has significant health benefits as well. So, you know, there's, there's all of those pieces and then doing my damnedest to be present to my family. Because I, I think that those are all of the, the key pieces. And when all of those elements are, are in place, um, I, I, uh, I don't know how else to say this, but I, I, I have the constitution of an ox. Like my, my, 
my energy and my capacity to direct and focus on things is is mm -hmm. um, is something I'm pretty pleased with, honestly. That's pretty awesome. How old are your boys? Well, eleven going on twenty-two, um, okay. and then the, <laughs> the youngest is uh, is seven, and he's still cute, so he hasn't started talking nice. yet. <laughs> so uh, I don't know how it's in Canada or in your household specifically, but. How do you deal with uh, electronics and phones and all that stuff to get the kids present? Uh, because we are, we don't have to retrain ourselves as much, but uh, uh, with our four kids, it's kind of like, I'm, I'm looking at it as a challenge. So I'm looking always for uh, advice. For me personally, I'm sure for 90% uh, of the people that are watching that have kids, uh, okay, same way, you have any secrets for that? So, um, so and I'm not proud of this. I don't think it's the right thing, but I can tell you that screen time is one of our number one disciplinary tactics. It's oh. like, if you're, uh, if you're misbehaving or you're not doing your thing, the screens are gone. Um, yeah. Whether that's good, bad, or otherwise. Well, we do the same thing because it sounds like, you, you know, you have to do what, take, take away what's important so it actually matters. And these days, really the screen is it. It's kind of crazy, but. Oh my so so I, I got to share this, this with you, uh, Mira, because <laughs> Um, we have four brands and we're hopping like crazy, but I actually have a, an idea that I haven't been able to actually shake yet, mm -hmm. um, which is a combination hardware software uh, process to help families manage exactly that, that entire scenario. And you know what I think is, is in 2018, I'm actually going to invest some money and develop it and see if it has legs because it is an epic issue across the board and it's certainly an issue in our house and I know we are not alone. Yeah, um, well, definitely not. How old are your kids? Uh, well, we have uh, the youngest one is eight going on 21. And I have a son that's uh, 10. And um, then my fiance has a uh, 12 going on 13 and a uh, 15 year old. So two girls, so three girls, one boy in the household. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's brutal how much uh, time they spend on those phones. So. And I'm told, and I don't know if it's true or not, I'm told that a teenage girl and her phone is you, you, you probably would have better luck trying to cut off their left arm. <laughs> probably. Yep. Uh, it's, it's good. Well, I mean, you know, so um, it's definitely, you know, an epidemic. So yeah, keep us posted on your development with your uh, new idea because something has got to have to, something has got to happen uh, because I don't know what, if we were growing up with phones attached to a wall and these guys have phones attached to their hands, I wonder where it's going to be attached to 20 years from now for the next generation. But, you know, yeah, who knows? Implant in your head, maybe. That's a very good <laughs> so, question. I know, crazy. All right, so let's switch to a little rapid fire. I got a few questions I want to ask you. Uh, first of all, I know with all the collections of books you have, it may be tough, but if you really had to pick a couple, three books that you maybe read every year or you, you know, you kind of have like this evergreen stuff that everybody should have on their bookshelf, what would it be? Well, you know, it's hard not to say Think and Grow Rich because I think that should be read on an annual basis. I think it's just a really yeah. good foundational grounding process. Uh, I'm a pretty big fan of Think and Grow Rich. Um, I'll tell you what, what one of my most meaningful books is, and, and even this conversation we're having about mission is the structure that I use for my mission statement that I still listen to because uh, it's recorded mm -hmm. in all those pieces on my phone, um, was actually from Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. I still think that is one of the yeah. greatest core foundational works under the sun. And of course, I love the mission, uh, the mission chapter perhaps more than most. Um, and then going back to, you know, this is... It, this is going to sound like a shameless plug and perhaps in a way uh, it is, but this idea of getting our own internal world straightened up. Um, I wrote a book called reframe your blame, how to be personally accountable. And that book is a workbook that helps line those pieces up. And uh, you know, in all seriousness, I do go back and read it every couple of years and, and I'll read it. And it's like, good Lord, man, that was a smart thing to write. It's like, I don't remember doing that, but that was good. But <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Do you, do you sell it yourself or uh, do, is it on Amazon or uh, where, where, if somebody you can grab it on Amazon, uh, heck, we could even, if you wanted to, if you wanted to give your community a complimentary copy, you could even just, I'll give you a URL and people could just download it digitally just because it makes a difference and it's powerful. Yeah, I definitely want to share a couple of the resources you've mentioned uh, up around the video somewhere below or above. Yeah, so is it better now? Cool. Yeah, I definitely want to share some of the resources above or below the videos so uh, we can include the book with it as well. 
Um, so that's cool. Uh, how about people? People in your life, mentors, people you look, look up to, alive or dead? Alive or dead. <laughs> um, you know, I'm kind of funny that way, is that I have, I have a variety of people that I, um, you know, work with in terms of what I'm dealing with and facing at any given point in time. Um, but I've not really had the big, um, you know, one earth shattering mentor. I'll, I'll tell you, and, and, and from my bio, you, you know this, um, I think one of the greatest human beings ever walked to planet earth is uh, Martin Luther King Jr. I think that the stand that he uh, took and in the face of, of those challenges, absolutely mind boggling and mind blowing. Um, if you ever get a chance uh, uh, to visit uh, Bedeck in, in Canada, um, there's the Alexander Graham Bell Museum. Alexander Graham Bell is simply one of the most astounding and brilliant inventors that was so far ahead of, so far ahead of his time um, that it's mind-boggling to think about what the hell does this truly and genuinely mean. Um, he, just to put this in perspective, back in the 1800s, he invented a cell phone that carried sound waves on beams of sunlight oh. that actually worked. The limitation was it had to have a beam of sunlight. Um, yeah. But I mean, anyway, he was just utterly and completely brilliant. Um, and then, you know, in current days, in current times, um, I got to tell you, and, and, and this is, and I, I, I'm hesitant saying his name because I think most people look up to him because of his billions. Um, I don't really give a shit about his money. But I, I think Elon Musk is, um, is a walking testament to genuinely putting your money where your mouth is mm -hmm. to better humanity. And whether he had 12 bucks to do it or $12 billion to do it, whether you like his cars, whether you like his, his views, I don't care. Um, I challenge anyone to come up with someone else on planet Earth mm -hmm. that puts their money where their beliefs are for the good of humanity in the way that he does. Yeah, I agree with you. I actually just uh, read slash listened to his uh, biography on Audible maybe a month and a half ago, and I had the exact same reaction to it. It's uh, like that guy, it, it's just unbelievable what he's done with the space program, with the car stuff. And some of the stuff was actually interesting to see that he didn't really start it from scratch. He just, you know, changed the existing uh, flow. So the, the rocket was already launched, but he stepped in and made it better and just did the whole thing with Tesla and whatever. So uh, PayPal initially. So it was uh, it was really good. I would strongly recommend everybody reading his biography or listen to it on Audible because uh, it will, like we always say, you know, set bigger goals, think bigger. I mean, this guy is definitely master of thinking big. Uh, Colonizing Mars, like just what all of us think of in our, in our spare time, you know, it's just yep. quicker. Um, and can, I, can I make one other recommendation? And, and, and sure. you know, I, I travel, you know, much of the world. I watch speakers everywhere under the sun. But there's a, a young man named Tim Urban, and he writes a blog called Wait But Why. Okay. And, I, and he calls it a long-form blog uh, site. I call it a short-form book site. Yeah. <laughs> But but he he is uh, he's been writing about AI and the influence and the impact that uh, artificial intelligence is going to have on our world and on our families and on us in the next ten to fifteen years. And by God, everybody should have some awareness of this because it is going to be quite astounding. Um, it'll be an upheaval of epic proportions and opportunities of epic proportions. But mm -hmm. you're going to need some education to figure out which side of those things you're going to be on. That's really cool. Yeah, as we were, we were talking about the books, I was just thinking about Thinking Grow Rich, actually, how the first year I read it, I couldn't get through it. The second year I read it, I got through it and picked a few things from it. The third year, it was like, oh my God, this is like the best book ever. And then every year, I read it every single year, uh, usually starting in January, and I even bought a version uh, that's um, a Czech version, so I can read it in the Czech language. And uh, it's, it's, it's really cool, but, Anyone that's ever tried to tackle Think and Grow Rich, if you have not succeeded the first time, keep on trying because it gets better every time you read it. And it's mind blowing how much you can pick up from a book that you've read eight or 10 times already um, when you do it over and over again. So I would definitely strongly recommend it to people that haven't not heard of it. Um, 
And maybe we'll even throw a link to Amazon to get it because it is one of those books you should always have. I completely agree. And, and, and I want to just even, if I, if I may, just speak to something that, that is big for me in the personal development world, in the mastermind world, all of those pieces, is I think that, that you know, the three most dangerous words in the English language um, and they're more common, it seems, and keep in mind that I've been at this 30 years, and they're more common today than I think that they, than they have ever been, in my humble opinion, uh, is I know that. Oh, I read that already. Oh, I know that. Yeah. Oh, I saw it on Oprah, and I told my friend, and I taught it to them. But I, I'm all good. Um, you know, the reality is this, is that we today are drowning in information, and we are starving for wisdom. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is that lots of people know shit, but they can't actually make it real in their life. And the standard that I would ask everyone to start playing with is not, do I know this? That's not the question. That's an irrelevant question. It means nothing. The question is, am I living it and do I have these results? Yeah. If you're financially free, then hey, you probably don't need to worry about uh, reading a book. If you're not financially free, don't tell me you know it. Yeah. And the same holds true about your health. The same holds true about the quality of your relationship. The same holds true about the quality of your parenting. I don't give a rat's you know what about what you think you know. There is only one measure of that. And is that real in your life? Do you get to walk your kids to school in the mornings? Yeah. Do you get to start your work day at 11? Do you get to go on two months of holidays? Do you have like, the, that's the reality by which we measure. Not some BS. And yes, I know that because I read the book. So I encourage everyone to go back and reread anything and everything and retake courses and go back because if it isn't already in your life, you still don't know it. Yeah. So that's awesome. Uh, I always uh, talk about time management in these interviews and ask people for, a tid for people for a tidbit. So one of those things would be, yeah, I already know about time management. Give me a quick little example of how do you manage your time uh, during the day? Horribly. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I guess here's, here's the, the, the truth of this. I really don't. Um, do, do we have a moment for this? Because I have a philosophy about yeah. this that, that I think is, is more important. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't manage my time, you know, by the minute or any of those sort of things in any way, shape, form. In fact, that would just drive me crazy. Um, in the same way as, as, as a young man, um, I threw away budgets very early. Like I, I was, it, if it took me two hours to go through my budget to figure out what was going on, I knew the, the odds of that actually being sustainable was exactly that. Yeah. So I'm a big believer of the big rocks first. Just get the big rocks in there. And if the big rocks are in there, the rest of the shit takes care of itself. Yeah. And uh, so the big rocks for me are family time, self-care time, get to work. And when I say I, I'm going to be at work, then I get to work and I work. And I don't worry about anything else because I'm working. And when I'm working out, I don't worry about work because I'm working out. Yeah. So, so just get the big rocks in first. And I did the same thing financially. So early on, like I started investing in, I guess, what you guys would call a 401k mm -hmm. when I was 16 years old. You know, that was the money that actually I came out and bought personal best seminars when, you know, I was the least likely person to do it. Um, yeah. But it's just always been this idea of I don't have the time, the willingness or the energy to micromanage three minutes or to micromanage 14 cents. All I know is this, is that if I design my life and my business, that I take care of my family, I take care of myself, I take care of my contribution, and those are the biggies, and I put the other stuff around it, that's the same as I pay myself first and I invest that, I buy mm -hmm. a couple of houses a year, I restore a car or two a year, and the rest of it pretty much takes care of itself. You know, so I, I have a, I have a, I, I don't have a great tip except don't get stuck in the thick of thin things. I see mm -hmm. lots of people doing these very complex processes when the core big rocks aren't in place. Well, you're saying you don't have any big tips, but I think that's a huge tip is to take care of the big things first. I think Brian Tracy has a book, uh, Eat That Frog, uh, that talks about doing the first, the biggest thing, whatever. So, you know, in your case, you describe it as, uh, you know, the big rocks on all the different, as in the different aspects of your life which I think is awesome. I think that's a phenomenal tip. So thank you for sharing that. And, uh, um, you know, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people that will relate to your way of time management versus somebody that's time blocking every minute of their life. So, you know, everybody has different preferences. So that's pretty awesome. I, I would poke my eye out with a fork if I had to do that. <laughs> I hear you. So uh, I want to ask you about keys to success. You already shared some stuff on the business side, but if you had to share maybe one thing in your relationship with your wife 
and uh, one thing on maybe happiness, key to success in a relationship and key to success in happiness? Oh, good questions. You look like a happy so guy to me, so whatever, that, whatever it is you're doing, you do, you're yeah. doing pretty, pretty well, good. My wife and I have been together, we're high school sweethearts. So, uh, well, well, and when I say together, I mean we're always in a relationship. Although uh, we did date other people, but we were, we were still like truly genuinely friends, like help each other out for college and those sorts of things. Um, so I think that the number one thing for, um, for Corey and I, and I actually write about it in the book that, that, that I that will give away, is that we created a framework for how support looks and what we can um, ask for. And it relies on some self-awareness in terms of what are my needs and, and what do I require in terms of being sort of whole, complete, healthy, happy, all of those pieces. And we create an agreement that we strive to live into. Please understand this does not always work. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it's less about the mechanics and it's more about the intention of it. And we create a framework where the deal is this, is that if Corey asks me directly for anything and it is possible for me physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually to do it, I will. And if I can't, I say no and I tell her how come. And I'll still support her in getting that need met because it may not be able to come from me. Sure. And that is the same the other way. If I ask Corey for something directly, clearly, and honestly, and it's physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually possible for her to do it, she will. If she says no, that's well and fine. This is how come. And I still support her in getting that need met. So what, what we created was a framework for us to be able to talk about, tell the truth, and invite the possibility to get whatever needs we have fulfilled. Now, the crazy thing about that is in the context of that framework, guess what happens to our needs? Because, because just the, it sounds crazy, but just the very act of being able to know that there's another human being who stands for me in a space of love and support that wants me to be, do, and have what I want, that in and of itself is a game-changing experience. So I think the, the, the tip here is, number one, do your own work so you know what it is that you actually want, need, and require in terms of being happy for you. And it's different for all of us. Number two, create the framework, the honesty, and the space to have the conversations with those that are closest to you to get that done. And of course, you know, this is, you know, one of my brands is JVology. And, you know, we, we say joint venturing is a game of I'll go first. Mm. If, I want somebody to step up and be willing to play this game, then I've got to be willing to step up first. So I mean, in that stand of giving, in that stand of investing, in that stand of, um, I want for you what you want. So how can we make this work? So that to me would be the, the, the guiding principle for Corey and I in terms of navigating our way through 30 years of life um, and quite literally growing up together. I mean, we started dating when we were like 15 and 16 years old. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Congratulations. Uh, so what, uh, how do you stay happy? What's, what's happiness to you? You know, I, honest to God, I think happiness is a default state, at least for me. Yeah. Um, so it's not a, it isn't for me so much a question of staying happy. It's, um, how do I design my life, my relationships, my business and my world in such a way that it doesn't trigger unhappiness. <laughs> sounds like a, sounds like a decision you can make, uh, to be happy, not necessarily. As a kind well, of I kind firmly believe that's true as well. I, but I, but I, I think there's there's even a, a a deeper implication, Miro, which is I actually think that um, that it's our default state. Mm -hmm. Like it's more it, it's more our default state than is. Um, and this, by the way, uh, there, there's a caveat to the statement. It's more our default state than is, say, frustration, anger, angst, mm -hmm. all those sorts of things. If we have done our own personal evolution work. If yeah. we haven't done our own personal evolution work, well, then we're, we're still often like reactive, unconscious dingleberries. I mean, that just is, is yeah. Not yeah. But if sure. you've done a little bit, done a little bit of work and, and we see what's going on and we begin to get purposeful about it. The, the question isn't how do you stay happy? The, the question is, you know, what interferes with, with happiness? Mm -hmm. well, one of the things that interferes with happiness is, is not putting the big rocks in first, not being as consistent with my self care routines as possible. Not having enough time to play with my boys, um, not getting away a for some exciting adventures with my wife, um, limiting my contribution to the planet, like all of those. So, so that becomes the, the conversation, which is um, 
get rid of the silliness and the natural state is, if that makes any, I, I don't know if that makes any sense to you. It ma makes a lot of sense. And as you talk, I'm, I'm thinking when we were born, you know, nobody is born stressed out and mad and angry or whatever. It's like you are really born happy. Everything gets screwed up in the process of growing up and the environments and the influences in your life. But really, you, you know, you said it's kind of the default state. And I totally agree. I, I can imagine that really, you know, we were born happy. Uh, and if you become unhappy, that's a consequence of something else, but... Can I add something to that? Do we, do we have time to... Because there's actually an interesting thing going on right now in my, in my family that's, I think, quite fascinating. So my oldest boy, Wyatt, um, he could be a professional shopper. He mm -hmm. feels currently um, happiest when he's spending his dad's money. <laughs> And, and we're working on teaching him entrepreneurship so he can spend his own money. Um, but so for my, I, I've been a, uh, I'm a car guy and, and literally I did, you know, my first car deal when I was like 12, 13 years old, I've been restoring uh, cars for eons. I paid my way through university business of men, importing, restoring Porsches when uh, free trade happened. So for my, but I'm a bit of a value driven guy. So I, I don't buy new cars um, because there's depreciation. So for my 50th birthday, I bought myself a new uh, Porsche 911 Carrera 4S that I picked up in Germany at the factory and drove all over Germany for 10 days. And, uh, and that was a difficult decision for me, even though I love the mark, even though I could afford the process, all those things, because I'm against paying depreciation. So I had to square it in my head that going to the factory, driving the racetrack at the factory, seeing the museum, touring the, uh, the country, driving the Autobahn, all of those things is the cost of depreciation on my car. So if I can just square that in my head, then I did. So, so I did. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Sounds like a good reason. Sounds like a good reason to me. Yeah, it, it, whatever story I got to tell myself, right? Anyway, my son keeps asking over and over and over again, um, would you get an R8, an Audi R8? Well, what about a, mm -hmm. a Lamborghini? What about a this? What about that? And it's like, son, just like, please, you got to stop asking me that stuff because here's what you need to understand is I chose very clearly what I wanted and then I went and I got it and I have no interest in anything else. Yeah. And, and I think that this idea of happiness and, and, and the source of dissatisfaction for much of North America is the unconscious consumption trap. Mm. And in the unconscious consumption trap, no matter what you get, there's always the next step. There's the starter house, there's the medium house, there's the McMansion. There's the McMansion, then there's the, you know, all that BS. And, and one of the key things I think is the foundation of my happiness is I don't want for anything. Yeah. I set the standard, I got the standard, and I'm thrilled with the standard, and I really don't give a rat's, you know, what about anything else? And that foundation in terms of, family time, holidays, automobiles, cars, houses, all that stuff, it's done. I don't want for anything. And I think that that's a key foundation for happiness. I love it. So uh, the last question I have for you before we uh, wrap it up, um, what is your definition of success? I mean, success means different things to everybody. So I love to ask this question at the end, typically, just to show you know, that early success doesn't mean the same thing to yeah. all. That's a really great question. Um, you know, I, I think the, the self-centered answer is to live life on my terms. Mm -hmm. um, I think the more meaningful answer, it actually even, you know, grabs me a bit emotionally, um, is to be a great dad. That's great. It, it's for me to be present to my boys, um, for them to look back, um, well, hopefully fondly, um, but, but, for them to look back and to, to recognize and to see um, what they learned, what their opportunities were, um, how their life is, um, and to know that they were loved and taken care of. That's pretty sweet. That's an awesome uh, definition. So before we uh, wrap it up, uh, I would like to give everyone an opportunity to connect with you. So we've mentioned a few things uh, during the interview already, but uh, what can, um, you share and how can people get in hold of you and uh, get more for of you if, if they if they choose to well that would be fantastic um so to me there there's three things and i'm going to start with with what i is sort of the most timely opportunity uh, which is this is we do an event um, called mastermind to millions live and what it is is the live experiential version of those six pillars i taught 
uh, or, or gave the highlights to. And we actually work through those pieces so that people can position, launch, and lead their own mastermind. And that's coming up in Phoenix, September 15th to 17th. Um, and Mara, if you're cool with it, I would absolutely, you know, just as a, as saying thank you to you, um, I would give a, uh, the tickets are regularly nine ninety seven, um, and I would do a, what we call a guest seat deposit if, and which means they could come for free. Um, and it's as simple as this. They go to mastermind to millions live.com forward slash guest. And then they do make a $197 seat deposit. And when they come to register for the uh, pick up their name tag, they get their hundred ninety seven dollars back. So it, it's a registration fee that says I'm going to show up. By the way, if you don't show up, you don't get your hundred ninety seven bucks. Back. Of course, I think that's really fair. That's awesome. Yeah, we call it the no flake fee. <laughs> and if you're going to be a flake, don't do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so that's coming up, and that is an incredibly powerful three day event. The feedback we get from it is astounding, and you will leave with a lived experience of what a mastermind is if you're not already in a mastermind. Mm -hmm. a structure for what your promise is going to be. And we will teach you a variety of pieces from each of the six pillars that you can take away and apply immediately. So that, that's to me the greatest thing that I could offer to really help people get moving fast in that domain. Now, if you happen to be from, well, I was going to say from Australia or something like that, but we have a whole bunch of people from Australia, from France, from Oslo, from French Polynesia, from all over God's green earth coming. So you could still get in the plane. Uh, but if, if you can't get it, Get, get to that, then you can also get that 52 page manual I was telling you about. And that's just at mastermindtomillions.com. Just mastermindtomillions.com, you'll get that 52 page manual. And uh, that's an easy way for you to start getting the wheels turning about masterminds. Mm, perfect. And then in the personal development field, um, if you just go to reframe your blame, um, and I'm just going to, I want to confirm this, this URL just because I, I, I don't usually do this, but we got talking about it and I just want to make sure it's correct. Um, so it's reframeyourblame.com. Make sure this is correct. Yes, that does it. Just reframeyourblame.com, and uh, you can actually download a complimentary copy of my digital, a complimentary digital copy of that book. And uh, that's a really powerful workbook. Um, there are, in fact, a variety of, of, uh, of psychologists who actually have this book as required reading before they'll take clients on at a particular level. So it, it's really good work, but don't just get the book to read it. It's a workbook, do the work. In. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. I think that's super generous. And uh, for everyone you watching, I think this was a pretty phenomenal interview. Hope you agree with that. Uh, I have so many new ideas and I hope you really took notes. If uh, not, just go and watch this interview again because it's uh, full of awesome nuggets. And um, Jay, thank you so much, man. It's so much for 45 minutes. Uh, this, is, uh, this, this was a pleasure uh, chatting with you. Thank you for sharing the resources, uh, your um, own overnight success story. And uh, I really uh, I had a blast talking to you. So thank you so much. And I hopefully and I'll see you at one of the events or uh, somewhere down the road in person again. That would be fantastic. Thank you, Mary, for having me. I truly appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks so much.